nonprofit uh, education funding here in Massachusetts via Chapter 70 and the new federal uh, reauthorization of the uh, of the uh, what was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and now it is the um, uh, it has been called the ESSA. And I'm Every student the succeeds. Every student succeeds. Every student succeeds act. Thank you. Um, we have a distinguished panel with us this morning, and let me uh, begin by introducing them. Linda Noonan is with the uh, Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education. Mitchell Chester is the uh, Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education. Senator Pat Jalen is on the uh, Joint Committee for Education in the Massachusetts Legislature. For set, uh, Professor Martin West is with the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And uh, Patrick Francomarco is the immediate past president of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, we appreciate your being here for this second of a joint forum that has been uh, being presented by the Worcester Education Collaborative, my organization, and the Research Bureau, Tim Lavorsi's organization. Uh, so thank you for being here, and I'm going to turn things over to Linda Newman now. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with the Research Bureau and the Worcester Education Collaborative. Um, to talk about two very, very monumental issues that we could probably spend the day on one, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act and school finance. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on bios, because you want my copy of the bios. Um, but um, <laughs> all of these people have very long and distinguished records of accomplishment, and some of them I'm sure you know well. But I thought that um, we would start with um, a discussion of the, the context in which all of this is happening. And so I'd like to ask Senator Jalen to um, begin. I know this is not the order, but we had the commissioner replace Jim Heisner and so right. I. Okay. Can I, is it on your computer? Yes. Yeah. Thank yes. you. And, and give us a perspective from the state of what is happening with school funding and what the legislature is likely to do this year or perhaps next? Uh, soon. Soon. As soon as possible. Uh, and I'm just so grateful to be invited here, especially so early in the morning. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea how many people would be trying to get to this very place at this time of day. How do I make it? Oh, I see. I just push forward. Okay. Um, so I was especially happy to hear from Jennifer, whom I know from when she was Secretary of Elder Affairs. Um, in 1993, the Supreme Judicial Court ruled that Massachusetts has a constitutional obligation to offer all children an adequate education, regardless of the wealth of their communities. That same week, the legislature, and I was there, passed the Education Reform Act establishing a foundation budget. And you have to understand that the foundation budget was based on calculations of what an adequate education would be. For example, for 100 middle school students, it would be four teachers. There would be amounts for instructional materials, administration, and other aspects. For seven years, we kept the promise, and that's what you'll see on the left that we doubled state aid to local education and phased in increases, which at the end were $1.2 million more than they had been uh, in 1993. It was doubled in an equalizing way, and the results were that three different studies of Massachusetts school finance in the 1990s found that the achievement of students in previously low spending districts went up. But in 2001, the good times were at an end. Tax cuts were phased in at the same time the economy slowed. And you'll see on the second part of the slide, this is adjusted for inflation. Uh, so both sides are adjusted for inflation. But you'll see that we have, we have fallen behind inflation. So uh, as a pr school budgets continued to go up, 
and as state aid went down, state aid became a smaller portion of, local, of uh, school spending. Still worse, the cost of health insurance, as you probably all know, rose far faster than anyone anticipated. And the cost of special, special education far outstripped the assumptions. So other priorities were squeezed. Except for the highest wealth districts, all communities, including Worcester, are shortchanging their students compared to what we thought in 1993 was adequate. Okay, on the left you'll see the orange is the foundation budget. No, I'm sorry. The blue is the foundation budget. The orange is what people are actually spending. So you'll see that people are spending over a billion dollars, the districts are spending over a billion dollars more on health insurance than was anticipated and added together on special education, they're spending more, more than a billion dollars more than was anticipated in 1993. The highest wealth communities were able within Prop 2 and a half limits to increase spending enough to provide about the number of regular education teachers. The rest were not. So these are uh, communities grouped by wealth. On the left is um, the foundation budget. I mean, on the, the blue is the foundation budget. The orange is actual spending. So this is the amount they're spending on regular education teachers. You'll see that the lowest spending communities or the lowest wealth communities are spending 32% less than was, it, uh, was deemed adequate. Only the highest 20% of district in wealth are spending a little bit above what we hoped, what we thought was adequate. Worcester is among the communities that spends right at the foundation level, which is, as we've seen, inadequate. Mayor Petty testified that when your choices are between secondary course offerings and school nurses, it's not an adequate budget. When your choices are between school adjustment counselors and literacy support, it's not an adequate budget. Worcester, for example, spent almost $30 million more per year on health insurance than the foundation budget allows, although they changed their plans, increased their contribution rates, and increased their deductibles. Despite significant efforts to reduce costs and bring services in-house, Worcester spent almost $30 million a year more than foundation on special education. Recently, your assistant superintendent, Brian Allen, told your school committee that if the foundation budget had been updated to reflect the true costs of health care and special ed, Worcester would be receiving $93 million a year more in state aid. It would have 661 more regular education teachers. And because it was spending right at foundation level, it was spending less than a third of the amount it, uh, anticipated for administration, um, two-thirds of what was needed for operations and maintenance, 40% for professional development, and a third of what was recommended for instructional materials. When the Foundation Budget Review Commission, of which I served with three of the panelists here, um, held hearings around the state, many people affirmed that the costs of health care and special ed have ridden, risen so much that if a district spends at foundation, regular education is squeezed. The superintendent from Wachusett testified that they were using textbooks older than the students. People from Holyoke said that their kindergartners had 27 students, many of whom started without knowing their alphabets or even English. We also heard that the foundation budget doesn't reflect the new costs of assessment and technology or the real cost of trying to educate children from low-income homes who come to school with less preparation and support. Yet the schools with the most children living in poverty were the most likely to be funded at levels that are clearly inadequate. In this slide, the districts with the highest percent of low-income students are on the left. Those with the lowest percent of low-income students are on the right. All, and it shows <clears throat> the spending compared to foundation. Most of the districts, almost all of the districts on the left are spending right at foundation. 
of the districts on the other side, the higher income districts are spending far above foundation. The average across the state is uh, average district is spending 22% above foundation. Most communities that could afford higher taxes put the extra funds in to avoid bigger class size, and communities that are poor didn't. So low-income students get less of the resources they need from government than affluent children, which is exactly the, what the court ruled unconstitutional in 1993. And this affects children's opportunities. There's a real high correlation between students' family income, school spending compared to foundation, and test scores. We saw the uh, relation of spending and income. This is spending, uh, this is income versus achievement. On the left are the districts with low test scores and the percentage of high of students living in poverty. On the right are <coughs> High spending district, the highest spending districts, and the percentage of students living in poverty. So that's the ones that spend uh, low. The ones that spend low have low achievement. The ones that spend high have high achievement. Um, so the students with the most challenges have the greatest gap between needs and resources. This was recognized by the foundation budget at its inception but not updating the formula has again left those children the farthest behind. But the problem, an, another problem is that the accountability measures of the state cause schools that educate poor children to be labeled low performing because of the correlation between income and achievement. That label leads many, leads many families who have the ability to leave to choose charter schools, school choice, or to move. That self-selection increases the concentration of children with challenges and lowers the average scores in their schools. The foundation budget report says that the good work begun by the foundation, by the Education Reform Act and the educational progress made will be at risk as long as our school systems are fiscally strained by the ongoing failure to substantively reconsider the adequacy of the foundation budget. Yet Governor Baker's proposed budget reflects none of our findings. While state revenues are up 4.3% this year, the governor proposes only a 1.6 increase in state school aid, which doesn't come close to meeting the needs of the children of Massachusetts. We can't implement the full recommendations right away. That would be an additional $1 billion in state aid. But as in the 90s, we can phase in the recommendations starting in this year, in the budget we passed this year, with a schedule that will get us to adequate state funding for equal opportunity. We can increase local aid to education in a way that recognizes the greater needs of children in poverty, children with disabilities, and children who are learning English. We have broken the promise of 1993 ed reform to educate all children fairly. We have held teachers, schools, and districts accountable to new standards without providing the resources they need to succeed. We in the legislature and you in the public should hold ourselves accountable to the promise of equal opportunity. We say no excuses for students, no excuses for teachers, no excuses for schools. We make excuses. There is, we say there is no money for the, what our children need in one of the richest states in the richest country in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I, I should have um, mentioned that the Senator was first elected to the legislature in 2005, and she represents the second. Oh, 1990, no, actually, in the House. In the, the Senate in 2005. Yeah. I am sorry, 1990 in the House. She has served a long time and served on a uh, school committee before that and represents the 2nd Middlesex District, which includes Medford, Somerville, and parts of Winchester and Cambridge. Um, thank you very much. We're now going to turn to Patrick Francomano, who has been a school committee member for 22 years and mm. past president. Sorry, I 22. do not want me to mention that. <laughs> um, and thank you for your service. And uh, past president of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees to give the local perspective. Thank you. And I'm going to set, my, because of the fact that we're on a tight time I'm going to oh, set. Oh, sure. I get a timer. <laughs> Everybody except for the Senate. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. Uh, as, as happens uh, frequently because of her, because she does such a great job in representing educational needs, uh, Senator Jalen has, uh, her presentation has made me somewhat redundant. Uh, we have not done anything for 20 years since the, uh, since that reform was put in, put into place in terms of the foundation budget. Uh, one of the things that Mass, that Mass Association of School Committees is, is concerned about is that there is discussion, as Senator Jalen uh, indicated, that you know, we have many communities who are funding above foundation budget. But the reality of their funding above the foundation budget is that it's simply necessary for them to do so in order to survive and provide basic services. If you look at those districts that are doing so, that are funding above foundation, you will find that most, for the most part, you'll see quality, solid quality educational programming, but certainly nothing that's extravagant, certainly no, none of the types of, of things that we really want to see in our schools uh, beyond the basics. The concept that state funding is adequate or that a budget should be commended based on representations, that the funding being provided is a certain percentage of the current foundation budget is I think intellectually dishonest. If you know, and we clearly do, that the current foundation budget guidelines are, un are dramatically understated, using it as a measure of commitment to education is totally inappropriate. It is not a guideline that we can use anymore. We have demonstrated by, through the factual analysis that the foundation budget is simply not in alignment with the current educational spending needs. State aid has not kept pace with required levels of spending, which requires municipalities in turn to pick up a greater and greater percentage of those increases, in, and then in turn impacting other services, municipal services. One of the things that we talked about in, in, that you may hear on occasion is the concept of the new state aid. This is not, and this is not new money per se. There's a perception that any additional funding at times should be spent in specific areas and that there should be uh, stringent accountability. But as the foundation budget is adjusted to reflect the proper allotment for particularly in, the, in, in light of health insurance and special education costs. Those dollars are already being spent at the expense of class size, electives in math, science, history, English language arts, business, music, and art. Despite what is said, most of our schools are doing great work with limited resources. Any influx of money will allow for the development and restoration of more vibrant, more flexible curriculum, and generally allowing for more innovation, like charter schools are supposed to be doing, and what we would love to be able to do. Another concern that we see, and especially in the gateway cities is the concept of wraparound services. Our communities are faced with serious emotional, economic, social issues that, their, that families and children uh, must address. We can't solve those in isolation and we are simply not qualified to address them in the schoolhouse. We need to look at wraparound services. We need to look at a broad consortium, if you will, 
of partners to help provide an opportunity to narrow that gap. The question becomes, does the executive and legislative branches have the will to take appropriate action for all the Commonwealth's children? And we are very fortunate to have a number of allies, including Senator Jalen, in the legislature who recognize the seriousness of this issue. The concept of the foundation budget was initially conceived as a good faith attempt to address the Commonwealth's inadequate funding of public education at the time. We are back to that point in time. History is repeating itself. If the Commonwealth is truly committed to fulfilling its obligations under the Massachusetts Constitution, we need to take whatever steps are necessary to address the funding gap. Thank you. So that gives you a perspective from the local and state level of some of the challenges around financing education. And Professor Marty West from Harvard Graduate School of Education is going to give us a perspective from the federal level and a little uh, overview of the new Every Student Succeeds Act and the new kinds of conditions under which state and local government will be operating. So thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, so as Linda said, my name is Marty West. I'm a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I think I'm also here to talk about this new federal law in part because I spent the, 2000, the years of 2013 and 2014 working as the senior advisor on education policy to the ranking member of the Senate Education Committee. And we didn't get a lot accomplished while I was on staff, but uh, we did write the first draft of what passed this December uh, as the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so I'll try to do my best to, in less than 10 minutes, uh, summarize this 1,000-page law, which is um, not an easy task. Um, but so the Every Student Succeeds Act, as, as people are starting to call it, is the latest reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the major federal education uh, law that gives money to states and on to school districts, especially to provide additional resources to serve disadvantaged students. And the way federal education policy works is given that the federal government has no designated constitutional role in the delivery of public education, the way in which it uh, exercises any role whatsoever is by placing conditions on the receipt of federal funds. So the federal government can't mandate that states or districts do anything, but it can say, if you take these funds, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And the last reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 2001, known as No Child Left Behind, represented a dramatic expansion in the types of strings that came attached, uh, that federal funds came attached with. In particular, uh, requirements around testing and accountability. Um, and so the Every Student Succeeds Act replaces No Child Left Behind, a similar title with a more positive framing, I guess, um, but uh, represents something of a rollback with respect to the demands that are placed on states in particular around issues of testing and accountability. So, uh, as I said, it's a thousand page law. I think a lot of what it does can be summarized uh, with five themes. So let me highlight those for you and what they mean for states like Massachusetts. Uh, the first theme, I would say, is just more deference to states. That's especially the case when it comes to the design of school accountability systems. So it says to states, you do need to have an accountability system in place. You still need to test students annually. But the way in which you use those test results and any other indicators you like to differentiate schools according to their performance, and then how you go about improving school performance when you identify schools as underperforming, all that is left in the hands of the states. They need to file a plan with the federal government, but the federal government can't much say much about what that plan looks like. Uh, another key area of deference to the state is in the area of teacher certification and teacher evaluation systems. So as No Child Left Behind it reached its last legs, 
Uh, the Obama administration offered waivers to states from many of the more problematic aspects of its accountability systems. One of them being that you needed to create new statewide educator evaluation systems based where possible, uh, in part on student test scores. Um, this has generated a lot of controversy, not just in Massachusetts, but nationwide. And Congress said, we're no longer going to say anything whatsoever about educator evaluation. Uh, so states now have to own their decisions that they make uh, and whether they continue down the path that they were encouraged under the waiver program. So the first theme, deference to states, especially when it comes to school accountability and teacher evaluation. The second theme are very tight prohibitions on the authority of the Secretary of Education to uh, extend the reach of the federal government beyond what is clearly specified in the statute itself. So I just mentioned the way in which the Obama administration used its waiver authority, which everyone agreed the Secretary of Education has in uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act the right to waive in any problematic provisions of that law. But the Obama administration said in order to get those waivers, you also need to adopt a set of policies that we want to see you adopt. So in effect, reauthorizing the law from the executive branch. And so Congress said that's not going to happen in the future. Uh, they placed very clear prohibitions on the authority of the Secretary of Education to use the waiver process in that way, uh, to do things like reviewing requiring changes to state content standards in response to some of the controversy around the Common Core, um, and to uh, sort of, through the regulatory process, try to make the law's requirements around school accountability more prescriptive than they are in the statute itself. So the second theme, tight prohibitions on secretarial authority. So those two themes, deference to states, prohibitions on secretarial authority, tell you that this latest reauthorization was less about disagreements over what a given education policy should look like, and more about who was making the decisions. So they wanted to see the decisions made more at the state level than in Washington, and in Washington, more in Congress than in the executive branch. So uh, that's the first two. The third starts to point more at what I think is the positive direction the law is trying to uh, take, its sort of vision for reform, and that, that there is that there's a much greater emphasis on transparency. So rather than being very prescriptive about accountability, they're going to try to use information to drive improvements uh, in outcomes. So this starts with maintaining the requirement that students be tested annually and that the results be disaggregated and reported uh, separately by student subgroup. They now extend this requirement to a number of additional subgroups, foster children, military connected children, uh, Congress really liked this idea, thought it was the one good thing that No Child Left Behind did, and decided to take it uh, even further. Um, you need to report uh, a variety of indicators. These are all requirements of what would be in a school or district report card. Uh, indicators relating to discipline, bullying, absenteeism, uh, participation in advanced courses like AP, IB, dual uh, enrollment programs. Um, you need to have uh, reporting on teacher qualifications. And you need to have reporting actually on spending at the school level and the district level relative to statewide averages uh, in each school and district report card. So there's an effort to promote transparency as a way of driving uh, improvement in policy. Uh, the fourth theme would be uh, there are a range of pilot programs in law aimed at encouraging innovation. So there's uh, a innovative assessments program that will allow up to seven states to uh, pilot new forms of student testing. Uh, for example, moving from grade level testing to competency-based testing uh, as the way of organizing an accountability system. Uh, up to 50 districts nationwide will be able to apply for the opportunity to take all of their federal funds along with state and local funds and use them to implement a weighted student funding system within the school district where uh, funds follow students to the school that they serve, uh, rather than being allocated to programmatic uh, purposes. Um, there are additional programs related to high school assessments. So there's a lot of pilot programs that states can take advantage of to increase their flexibility. And then the fifth theme is that the law really aims to promote the generation of and use of evidence to inform policy. So the law says, you, we're not gonna tell you how to go about improving your 
bottom 5% of schools, but we're going to require you to do something in those schools. And the one requirement is that you're going to have to make the case that what you're doing is evidence-based. And it defines for the first time what they mean by being evidence-based. And then this type of requirement extends to a number of other federal funding streams where the opportunity states have is to engage in evidence-based programming. So not following, uh, picking from a sort of federally prescribed menu of ways of using the funds, but rather saying, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a case that it's either based in evidence or that we're going to uh, implement it in such a way that will generate evidence on its effectiveness as we're doing so. And so I think, again, an opportunity for states to uh, innovate and improve what they're doing. So I think there are huge opportunities for states like Massachusetts, even as there are risks nationwide uh, about how states will use their new flexibility. Um, I think it, uh, the main thing to take away is that if in the past uh, many state policymakers in Massachusetts and elsewhere said we have to do this because the federal government told us we have to do this, the number of cases in when the, there was always questions about a lot of those claims actually because people thought No Child Left Behind required much more than it actually did. Uh, but the cases in which that is actually the case uh, are far more limited than ever before. Uh, and that means that states have to take ownership of the decisions they're making about school accountability. I think there are real opportunities to shift in a more sensibly designed system, one that recognizes the progress students are making in improving student achievement rather than being based fully on the level at which students are performing at any time. But the best way to take advantage of those opportunities remains to be determined and I think should be the subject of conversations here and elsewhere over the next year. So thank you very much. has an excellent article on the Brookings Institute uh, website that he wrote a couple of months ago about the evidence-based aspect of ESSA. Mm -hmm. I encourage you all, perhaps um, the link could even be sent to attendees because it's a very, very interesting new development, um, as are some of the innovation funds that have been set aside. Um, so now that you've heard these perspectives from various levels, state, local, and federal, we are fortunate to have Commissioner Mitchell Chester of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, who's known to most of you, um, who is responsible for dealing with all three levels and for the implementation of ESSA and the struggle on school funding. So, Commissioner. Good morning. Thank you to the panelists, uh, and so, so I think what I'll try to do is um, be a little bit provocative here, um, and and offer a few comments on both of the both of the topics. Um, so on the school funding topic, um, uh, just frame a little bit of perspective. Uh, public K twelve education is about a $16 billion enterprise. We, we serve uh, just under a million school children. So across the state, we're spending uh, roughly 16000 just a little over $16,000 per student. Now that varies a lot, as, as uh, Senator Jalen's display showed you. Some places are spending less than that, some considerably less. Some places are spending more than that, some considerably more than that. Um, I would argue, and I, I should have brought some slides that show this because I think it's pretty well documented in Massachusetts and elsewhere, that there's very little systematic correlation between spending and outcome. That's sort of counterintuitive, right? But if you look, if, if we had a, a two-dimensional graph that showed achievement on one axis and spending on the other, you wouldn't see a clear pattern there. We have, we have districts that spend below the state average that get very strong results. 
We have districts that spend below the state average that get very weak results. We have districts that spend above the state average that get uh, pretty, pretty modest results at best. And we have districts that spend above the state average that get very strong results. We have a cluster of districts around the state average. And there's no particular pattern, right? Some are pretty high performing, some are pretty low performing. It, it's actually quite striking. Um, in, in that regard, and, and I could give you a few examples um, of that. But my bigger point here is that as we talk about investing more in the system, my passion here is, my, my strong uh, concern here is that we also have to be asking the question, what are we doing with those dollars? And what are we learning about places that are getting strong results and their patterns of investment, where they're putting that revenue, what they're investing in, uh, versus those places that are getting weak results and where they're investing and where they're putting their resources. Um, and, and this has become a little more retail for me in the last four or five years as we've taken receivership of uh, now three school districts, initially Lawrence, uh, a year ago Holyoke, and most recently Southbridge. And Holyoke's a, 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 a very interesting case in this regard. Uh, the, the dominant narrative leading up to the State Board's decision to take receivership of Holyoke was this was a high need, low expenditure district. No question this is a high need district. This is one of the poorest districts in the state. It's also a district that spends above the state average, spends above, they're, they're at the top of the 10, we have 10 districts that we refer to as commissioner's districts. Uh, they include Worcester, they include Springfield, Boston, uh, and other places. This is a district that spends more than virtually all of those districts except for Boston. Uh, and so the question as we've dug in in Holyoke, is what are they doing with the money? Are they doing as well as they could be doing? And I have no confidence that uh, the dollars that are going into that system are being used as effectively as they could be. I'd love to have more dollars. Don't get me wrong on that. But I also think we have a responsibility to the taxpayers uh, and to the students and the citizens of these communities that as we ask for more money, we're willing to look at what we're doing with those dollars and ask the question, uh, are we doing the best we can with those dollars? Are we making the smartest investments? Uh, and so we're digging into this uh, in, in, uh, in the department, trying to get a better handle on expenditure patterns and, and what differentiates high leverage uh, decisions on spending versus low leverage decisions on spending. Special Ed is a very interesting area for, for the Commonwealth. We uh, identify students with disabilities at a much higher rate than virtually every state in the nation. Uh, there's two or three states that are roughly where we are. We identify one out of every six students in the Commonwealth as a special ed student. Uh, that's 17 percent. Nationally, the percentage is what, Marty, maybe 11 or 12 yeah. percent is, is the national identification rate. Um, and if you look at what happens to students who are identified as special ed, in Massachusetts, if you're a low-income student, you're almost twice as likely as a non-low-income student to be identified as special ed, and you're almost twice as likely if you're in one of our urban districts and a student of color from low income background to be educated in a substantially separate setting, which means you're not, which, which largely means you're not getting access to the general curriculum. Uh, and, and that's not happening to non low income students. So we have projects looking at why are we identifying at such a high rate? Are these really disabilities in students or to what extent do they reflect um, our, our failure to uh, better identify student needs, design instructional programs that address those needs, and prevent students from being behind in their literacy skills, which turns out to be one of the top reasons students are put in special ed classifications or in their math skills. 
so again, my, my, my basic theme on, on uh, the budget and spending is uh, I feel very strongly that we need to look at what we're doing with the dollars we have as we look at putting more money into the system to make sure that we're making the smartest decisions that we can. Um, on ESSA, uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, we're digging into this. We have a, uh, a public engagement strategy with this. We started to work with the state board on this. Um, I thought of it uh, a, a little bit as a, a bit of a Rorschach test. Um, those who were hoping that we'd get a federal law, I mean, if you know, if, if this gets a little bit weedy, if, if you know this context, right, educators have been waiting for what, 15 years since the, since the No Child Left Behind Act for the reauthorization. This is the Elementary and Secondary Act that was first passed in 1965, part of a, a, a package of civil rights legislation under President Lyndon Johnson, uh, very much uh, aimed at getting the federal government uh, involved in making sure that the most uh, needy of our students, the least advantaged of our students, the students who have struggled the most in our school systems, the students for whom our school systems have, have uh, done the, the least strong job of educating to make sure that our states and our locals are focused on those students. I mean, that was the initial intent. That remains the intent. So as we got to the reauthorization, long overdue, which, which is uh, the, the Every Student Succeeds Act, those who uh, wanted to see the federal government distance itself from No Child Left Behind and the very prescriptive requirements, the testing, the accountability, uh, uh, the, the very restrictive requirements around school improvement, see in that law that that's happened. <laughs> those who worried a lot that Congress would abandon this, this uh, central mission of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of holding states accountable for doing right by the students who were getting the least strong education were relieved to see key elements remaining in the law. And, and, and Marty did a great job of, of outlining those and uh, in, in putting an emphasis on transparency, knowing how students are doing, whether they're succeeding, whether they're progressing, and not just in the aggregate, but for groups of students. So this is a, a, a conversation that will continue, and I look forward to engaging the Worcester community in this regard. I would say to you that uh, Worcester's uh, done, done a, a, a strong job with your school district compared to many of our uh, urban areas. It's one of the school districts that's made some of the strongest progress over the last six or seven years. And so I look forward to seeing you continue on that path as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is the first panel I've moderated where every single speaker stayed within the time limit. So thank you all very much. Um, we're going to open it to questions. I just want to point out that you heard um, both Commissioner and Marty West talk about informing, using data to improve and this was also part of the charge and recommendation of the Foundation Budget Review Commission that districts would have to post data online in a clear and understandable way so that citizens would be able to understand not only where expenditures were being made, but what impact they were having. And that will be a challenge for everybody here to come up with the system that does that. Um, some of you may remember that my organization, MBAE, um, hosted just a a couple of data systems just for the kids and then know your schools. We stopped when the DART was developed by the department that provided that kind of actionable data. So I hope you'll join us in paying attention to that aspect of these initiatives um, and making sure that it helps us understand the impact of expenditures and also the need for, for where they are. I'm, we're open to questions or comments. I would ask you to introduce yourself and make it as brief as possible to give as many if, people a chance if, to if, speak. If I, if I, could, I, <laughs> could I just make a comment because the, the commissioner just uh, played the, play the provocative card. Sure. Uh, and I, I, 
I am concerned of the picture that is sometimes painted about the uh, reliability of school committees and school districts in terms of their spending, as if they are off as drunken sailors wandering through uh, the Commonwealth spending, spending their budgets nilly and willy and uh, over-identifying kids for special education because really that's what we want to do. Um, the, the reality of it is that we have a very highly public, very open budget process that we go through budget hearings, we go through, you know, we're subject to the open meeting law, and our, budget is, our budgets are out there for everyone to see, and the process is out there for everybody to see. And any implication that a school committee is not doing its darndest to spend in a, fiscally, you, in a fiscally conservative way, I think is is unfair and unfounded. Patrick, uh, I, I'm going to thank you for, for the comment. As a former school committee member, um, I didn't take that away from the, the comments. And I'm sure we could go on down this road, but I'd like to give the audience certainly. a chance for the, to to make their comments and ask questions, but thanks for, for making the comment. Um, please. Yeah, Constantino, we we'll saw you started out uh, as a school committee member in the 1980s, and reform was an issue then with the Special Commission on Excellence in Education report uh, that ended up being the 1993 Reform Act. Um, I've always considered special ed uh, the canary in the coal mine. And when we had excessive, and in the 1980s in Worcester, special ed was considered a dumping ground for students. The fact that we in this state, and I haven't checked the numbers with the school department here in Worcester, um, have a much higher proportion of special ed students than um, we should have, indicates to me, regardless of the transparency of the budget, um, and the complexity, and it's enormous in terms of federal and state involvement in lo local school systems and all the funding issues that are involved, that we still are doing something, I don't want to say wrong, but not addressing student needs. How are we going to deal with, and I, I guess uh, Commissioner Chester probably could answer this, dealing with special ed as a part of the larger picture of our success or failure Yeah, so, so we have um, uh, several projects underway to, to better understand uh, why in Massachusetts we're over-identifying low-income students and why uh, students of color uh, and low-income students in our urban districts are more often being placed in these substantially separate settings rather than educated largely in the mainstream and, and given the same opportunity experience the curriculum. We're working with uh, a handful of districts that are the greatest outliers in regard to those statistics that I just identified. Rather than treat this as a punitive issue, we're trying to understand with them why is it that this, this over-identification is happening and why isn't it happening in other districts? So we're also looking for districts that are outliers in the other direction and getting good results with students and trying to explore this with them and identify Ways to ways to uh, intervene with youngsters early in their career so that they get to second, third, fourth grade reading well, doing math well, not being identified as as a student with a disability and, and plugged in. So into after thirty years, I as and I'm on the city council now, still don't have an answer for why this is happening. Well, I think the the the, the high rate of identification in Massachusetts. Uh, in part a cultural piece, right? Yeah. We were first, we, we preceded the federal law around providing an entitlement to students with disabilities. And for a long time, we had a standard that was maximum feasible benefit rather than the, 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 the federal standard of free and appropriate education. And so that push, that, that created a, sort of a culture in Massachusetts of, of sort of looking to special ed as a way to get students more services. Jack? Uh, Jack Foley, I've been on the school committee out of Worcester since uh, 2000. It's been a challenge.
charge there. I came on board just as the funding was being cut, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of comments if I can. First, Commissioner, I'm glad you acknowledged Worcester at the end as far as our expenditures, what we're doing here. We certainly have a good sense of Worcester, where our challenges are, where our funding needs are, and where, you know, where the issues are for us to face financially. We've been doing this for several years. Brian Allen and Melinda Boone and, and other folks have really analyzed this. And I think we've led the effort as far as some of the foundation budget review discussions. Um, if we had the funding, we know where we'd go. The, the, the special education issue, I'm proud of the standard that Massachusetts has set for leading the way in, in the country. There's no, there's no rocket science here that you know, high poverty, low income sit in urban areas are going to have um, the students with great needs, significant needs, and it's going to cost funding, whether it's, you know, support for trauma or other assessments that are there in special education. We know that's happening. We see it at the kindergarten level when, when the children come in. So, and, and, and I agree with you completely, separate classrooms are not the way to go. But inclusion is expensive. Special development, the, the, the classroom support, we don't have the funding in place to do that properly, to be very honest. <coughs> My comment I'll make is really about the stigma of low-performing districts. And it's one of the issues I have with the assessment at the state level. That you know, right now, as the data says for Senator Jalen, if you're a, um, a high poverty, low income district, you're, you're gonna have you have students who have greater needs, but you're not getting the funding you need to address those needs. We've proven in Worcester with our level five schools with additional funding. Give it thirty hundred dollars per student, we get thirty four million dollars more if we had that across the district. We've shown that we can provide the supports and be very successful with the funding to serve those students. But we get, we get uh, stigmatized, frankly, as an underperforming district because we don't have the funding to serve those students properly. I agree with you, there are districts who are not performing properly. They should be dealt with appropriately. But the districts who are handling it well but don't have the funding should be assessed district. Can I just make a comment about that? So I uh, agree that the approach to school accountability that actually was required not just in Massachusetts but nationwide under No Child Left Behind, uh, one of its limitations was that it was exclusively based on the level at which students are performing at a, per a single point in time, which we know for reasons people have acknowledged uh, is a product not just of the school's performance but of a host of factors beyond the school's control. And that it did send out, uh, in some cases, very misleading signals about the effectiveness of schools of, in advancing their students' uh, achievement. And one of the opportunities that the law, the new federal law gives states is to incorporate measures of growth and achievement from one year to the next into its school accountability system. You still need to be transparent about the level at which students are performing, uh, which is important because that tells you where you need to improve. Uh, but you have uh, the possibility, uh, as I read the law, actually to go all the way in the direction of uh, growth and achievement rather than levels, which I think, um, you know, this is a, a uh, there's disagreement um, among education policy researchers, there's disagreement actually among uh, civil rights advocates about the extent to which it would be desirable to move from a level-based to a growth-based accountability system because to some degree, a level-based accountability system is more of a entitlement to, uh, you know, uh, may put more pressure um, to improve low-performing groups. Um, but I think uh, that it would be, um, that we should have a good conversation in the state about about maybe shifting more in a growth-based direction. No, I think, I think there's, were enough hands up that I want to give other people a chance to um, ask a question, the gentlemen. John Creole, I'm Superintendent in Worcester and uh, former principal. And I certainly agree with my colleague, but we have seen great results in Worcester of what we, how we're spending our money, but we don't have enough. And it's, it's ludicrous to think that uh, money doesn't matter in education. We know it does. And I, as a former principal, I certainly uh, you know, have seen it firsthand, and I certainly agree with Senator Hillary. One of the things we haven't addressed, and we continue to skirt around the issue, is the importance of prevention. We don't do enough about prevention. Where, where is the funding for our, our children in the early ages, preschool programs? We don't, we're not funding preschool programs the way we should. Those are the children that are coming into our schools in the kindergarten 
lacking the necessary readiness skills to be successful. But yet the funding isn't there, and yet we're not going uh, going out and trying to draw in those students uh, to make them successful in their early years. That's where we're going to we're going to, we should be putting uh, additional money, and that's where we can be successful. Senator, would you like to comment on early childhood? Uh -huh. That is actually, if I were going to put my money anywhere to reduce the achievement gap, if I was going to pick one place, it would be preschool. Yeah. That when kid, I think the point that. Um, both of you were making about growth. Once kids get to school, the school can help educate them. If they start out behind, they stay behind. And it's very hard to bring them up. So if you could help kids in the three to four, even zero to three, but start with three to four, that's doable. Those are the children that become very frustrated, turn off education at very early age. And they learn that they're dumb. They learn in first grade as they start taking oh, kindergarten, they start taking tests, and they learn that they're dumb, and they, many of them, uh, fail to continue to work. One, one, of, one of the, just on this point, uh, one of the uh, provisions of the Every Student Succeeds Act Federal Act, uh, which brings the largest source of funding it brings to uh, Worcester and other districts is the Title I, the so-called Title I funds. Uh, you can, as part of your plan for the use of Title I funds, you can put those funds into preschool early education, right? You have to make decisions. Again, you have to decide what's going to be the highest leverage and, and where are we going to get the most bang for the buck. Thanks. And you have to have a long time frame because you're going to be held accountable next year on your test scores. There were some questions here that I kept Sorry. on the other side. Maybe we've answered them. Robert Lane, Director of Outreach Programs at UMass Medical School. A comment was made uh, about the spending. How many other districts other than Holyoke are spending above and yielding poor results? I, I had a hard time swallowing that. I don't know how. So, <laughs> so the question is how many are spending above the state average and getting poor results? Uh, I don't know what you would define as poor results. But again, I, I, I regret that I don't have the, uh, the two-dimensional plot. But what you'd see is uh, you'd see a wide range of performance from low to high, and you see no particular correlation to spending. So I'll, I'll give you a district that I, I I'll give you a district that I don't think gets poor results. But a lot of people look at what they spend and wonder why they don't get better results. Cambridge public school spends probably at the one of the highest, if not the highest rate in the state, probably around 25000 per student. And most folks would argue that the results aren't particularly stellar. Well, I'm going to leave that up to Cambridge Public School. <laughs> <laughs> Bad choice. <laughs> Bad choice. <laughs> I think one of the challenges in looking at this is, again, we usually look at this relationship with the level at which students are performing on one of the axes rather than school's contribution to uh, student learning, which might actually, and does actually yield something of a different picture. But I actually agree with uh, the commissioner that the relationship between spending and performance, regardless of how you look at it, is much less mechanistic than you would, you would think. Sort of like the relationship between master's degrees and teaching performance. Hey. Uh, it's, we're we're largely out of the business, either, yes. But we require them. So, Jen? I'd like to ask the converse of that question. Are there districts that are uh, spending less and getting higher results? Um, there are. There certainly are. That would be very helpful for us to, given the missions of our two organizations, for us to know so that we can do an analysis of what they're doing. I, I, I can think of a number of districts um, uh, that, that spend below the statewide average. I mean, again, uh, what I can do, if it would be helpful, is send that, that, that graph, that chart that shows the relationship between um, spending and results. And I, and I know we've looked at it, uh, Marty, to your point, yeah. uh, with growth on, on the achievement yeah. access rather than, than absolute achievement. 
And I still don't think there's a very strong correlation when you look at it that way, but I'll re-examine that as well. Yeah. Well, can I just say that I think the metrics count? So there is, there's spending, and then there's compared to the foundation budget, which recognizes that there are differences if you have more ELL kids, if you have more low-income kids. Um, if, so I think that the spending needs to be compared. Holyoke spends right at foundation. It does not spend above foundation. Successful districts, most districts spend at least 20% above foundation. Then the second thing is, how do you measure results? Right now, we measure results by test scores in a limited number of subjects. And we do not recognize growth more than 25%. We did increase the metric and growth recently, and that's why Worcester is no longer in the bottom 10%, because you do a better job in growth than in achievement. But we didn't, in, it, we only counted a third of as much as we count the basic growth, and so I so much agree with Professor West. And I think with everyone who testified uh, on your panel in Washington, that growth is the metric. And if we measured by growth, Boston, which is a high, very high expanding district, uh, but, but not as much above foundation as most, Boston would not be in the bottom 10% of districts. So I think we need to look at the metrics and we need to say, do we care about anything besides test scores on two subjects? We are just about out of time, so I'm going to give the panelists a few seconds if you have any last comments, and we'll start at the end of the table with Patrick. Thank you very much, and thank you again for everyone, uh, for everyone that, that came today. Uh, the, here's the thing, I, and, and this goes to Senator Jacobs' point. Uh, the idea that we can judge school districts by a test, that we can ju judge teachers by a test, that we can judge students by a test. It's a lot more complicated than that. We cannot paint with such a broad brush. We need to look at the problem of education holistically. We need to take into account issues of English language learners, uh, low income. We need to look at this thing a lot broader than we are rather than narrowly identifying and condemning individuals districts, et cetera, to um, failure simply because of a very limited metric. Professor? Uh, let me try and connect the two topics, uh, the foundation one seconds. and the yeah, SF, so very quick, quickly. Uh, I think if you look back at the 1993 education reform law, I think it's widely interpreted that this was a sort of both and approach. We're going to put more resources in, but we're going to also uh, make some demands in terms of accountability. Uh, and that's what actually sort of distinguishes Massachusetts story from other cases of school finance litigation that sort of ended in these protracted stalemates with not a lot of uh, good coming out of it. I think, look, we're at another point. No one thinks money on its own is sufficient to sort of get us where we want to go. Uh, we need to figure out what package of reforms we're going to adopt at the same time that we uh, put more spending in, and the federal law provides a framework for uh, really a requirement that the state have that conversation. Where are we going? Uh, and um, so that's the opportunity that I hope the state, uh, the Commonwealth, embraces. And I guess I would just, I think I just did summarize my thoughts, but I think that the issue of transparency and accountability needs to be brought just, not just at the state level, but at the local level. And the more that you know about what's going on in your schools, the better you'll be able to spend what limited money you have and to advocate for better programs and better equity um, within your district. And then if you had more money, which we hope, you'll be able to spend it wisely. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I guess uh, my comments about uh, doing a, uh, a good job with the money we have as we add more money to the system was not aimed at school district decision making, right? We own that. We own that collectively. It's part of our part of the state's role to figure out what's what what's higher leverage, what's less less uh, high leverage, and we're trying to trying to get our arms around that with the help of school districts uh, as well. Um, at at the end of the day, uh, for me, it's about the students, and 
districts and education is a complex enterprise and it's a lot more than test scores. I, I'm the last one to say it's about test scores only. But when I see places where very few kids are reading on grade level, very few kids are doing math on grade level, those kids' future is being, is, is being uh, eclipsed in those situations. And I just can't sit back and hope that they're feeling good about themselves, other things are happening. I feel very, very, very much uh, an obligation and responsibility to work with those districts to the extent we can. And in places like Lawrence, where things were just going nowhere, half the kids weren't graduating. The ones who did had very low results. When they showed up in college, they weren't even making it through the first semester. I feel an obligation to be very uh, deliberate about intervening in those situations. Well, I want to thank you all. I think um, we covered a lot of ground. And uh, the US Secretary of Education, John King, in speaking to the chief state school officers recently, urged states to seize the opportunity that the Every Student Succeed Act provides. And I think um, the two organizations that sponsored this event are, should have our gratitude for starting the conversation here um, and uh, hope that we'll all convene frequently to seize that opportunity. And Tim? Yeah, no, I just want to thank the panelists. It was a great discussion. Um, you know, the, the link that we saw between ESSA and Chapter 70 is that there's real recognition that responsibility lies with state and local governments. Responsibility not just for funding, but for pedagogy and for operations. And so that is a discussion that needs to be happening here about where we go as a school district. And we can see there's a disproportionate concern or impact on the gateway cities like Worcester. And so we want to continue working Worcester Education Collaborative and the Research Bureau on this type of issue and how it impacts the city. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I want to acknowledge Senator Chandler who's here, Representative Keith, thank you for coming. Um, we have representatives from Senator Moore and Representative O'Day as well, Councillor Lukes, thank you for being here, and school committee members John Monfredo, uh, Jack Foley, and former school committee member Tracy Novick. So thank you all for coming. I also want to acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, we could not do these types of events free and open to the public without our sponsors. So Commerce Bank, Brian Thompson, thank you, uh, as well as Hanover Insurance Company who sponsored today's event. Um, and finally, we have a survey as you're leaving. Please fill out the survey. GDSO has it over there. Uh, we want to be held accountable as well. We want to make sure we improve our uh, operations efficiently. So please let us know um, what, how this panel went, what other issues you think we should be tackling, and where we should go from here. So thank you very much.